following <clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Oscar L Lukenheimer for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, uh, March the 5th, 2008, at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit okay, about... Okay, welcome you. Okay. Tell uh, us where you I, were born I, and your I parents... I go more by Ozzie now, O-Z-Z-I-E, rather than Oscar. I was born in Jones Gap, Indiana. You want to know where Jones Gap is? That would help the researchers. Kari Hill and uh, Mavis Hill and Scudder Hill meet at Bunty Crossroad. And Jones Gap in southern Indiana, oh, Vincent's a little suburb. Oh, I'm halfway between Freelandville and Edwardsport, out there in the country. And Jones Gap was a little mine where they mined coal down in southern Indiana. And they took little ponies down in the coal mine to pull the carts of coal down. And uh, this was on an 80 acre farm. And we had uh, six cows, 100 chickens, and if we're lucky, maybe 50, 60 pigs, and farmed with horses on an 80 acre farm. And uh, that What was, year were you born in? Oh, Your birthday. Right, nice round number, 1920. What year were you born in? Mm, mm, that, go ahead. <laughs> I don't want to be a... Tell us about your early years in school, going to school oh, down there. Went to Edwardsport High School, which uh, graduated in my class 26. And uh, back then, that was an average class. And I think there were maybe 12, 13 little schools in the county, like it used to be. And, of course, uh, basketball was big because you compared to uh, how well you did with the uh, neighboring schools. But, um, and I'm going back to the 70th reunion at Edwardsport in a few weeks, and I believe I and uh, one other are the only one living in our class of 26. Now, I've, I've said this in other things too, that um, I uh, didn't have much knowledge of where I was going after I graduated from Edwardsport, but my voca vocational ag student, teacher one day, said, Oz, I'm going to Peru on Saturday, I want to take you along. And I probably said, where in the heck is Peru? Anyway, he brought me up here and introduced me to the university, and somehow I was able to get in. I'm, I'm not a very smart guy, and, and I, I still question, how in the world did I get through? But I did some way, and when I got here, we had never had chemistry in Edwardsport High School, so I said, ag chemistry, boy, that sounds sophisticated. I have farm background, but when you put agricultural chemistry together, oh, that sounds sophisticated. But here I got in chemistry classes that uh, people had two, three, four years of chemistry, and I had, didn't have any. And did, did, I, did I ever struggle? But somewhere along the line, I ended up in agronomy. And I did that mainly because I needed a job. And I went to Dr. Scarseth, and uh, I say back here somewhere, uh, and you might be interested in this kind of stuff, uh, that they wrote me up from the land of Oz. A anyway, I, I say, I think somewhere here, that he asked me to come back about four times before he gave me a job to work in the soil testing lab back in 1939 for 25 cents an hour. And he did that mainly to see if I had the persistence to, to want the job bad enough. So I'd go back and, Doc, Dr. Scarsa, don't you have a job for me? And finally he hired me. Was so, this while you were still in school? Or I had you graduated? I, I was a sophomore. I was an undergraduate. And that's when I switched to agronomy. Okay. Rather where than where that, did you live on campus? I lived in a private home and uh, that was the way it was done back then, if you remember. 
every one of these homes here in in West Lafayette, about everyone, had a room that they rented to students. We didn't, we had a few dorms, but not very many. And so that was where you lived. And I came here and uh, started in agronomy. And what, I, what year was that now? That, that was in 38, I started in agronomy uh, in Purdue, and in 39, I switched to agronomy. And Dr. Scarseth was r relatively new on staff, and he was a, an agronomist with chemistry background. And um, he started soils graduate work in agronomy. And there wasn't much so, uh, graduate work in agronomy at that time, but he collected about uh, a dozen graduate students. And here I was working in the soil testing lab my immediate supervisor was one of his grad students, and uh, I learned to know them pretty well. And so uh, when I graduated from Purdue in 42, Doc uh, says, you ought to do research like these other grad students are doing. And uh, so they took me under their wing, and we did field research a heavy fertilization of corn, tomatoes, and sugar beets. And uh, I got one year of research in before the war. Then I went to the war and came back in 49. And uh, I got credit for a little bit of research that I did uh, back then. And they, the people who I worked with uh, wrote it up for me. But uh, that had all changed, and Dr. Scarseth wasn't there. Dr. Conkey and his wife lives there, uh, Gerda Conkey. And he's German, from Germany. And uh, he found me some support money for uh, doing irrigation on corn. And I say that it was the first irrigation of corn in Indiana. You know anything about corn? Well, you, that was just when hybrids were starting. WF9 is an inbred, and to increase the parents of, of hybrids was quite a difficult job because when you combined inbreds, you got hybrid vigor. But those inbreds themselves were, were kind of feeble, but then you, you united their strong points. And uh, I doubled the yield of this inbred with irrigation. I felt good about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. What was the campus like when uh, you when what you came back? What was the campus like when you came back? That's the question they asked somebody here. Of course, just like uh, Barbara Cook, I think said it was small. And I think um, uh, we we always talked about the ratio of boys to uh, heads to co-eds. And uh, we said it was 10 to 1, so the chances of finding a, a gal was pretty slim. But I imagine about four, no, it was a little more than that, six, 7,000 students, maybe. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on it. Okay. I don't know. Go back and check it out. But uh, there weren't too many students on. Uh, Campus. Right. We're and, then go ahead. Now, now you're in agronomy. What? After I'm in agronomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I'll give you a copy of this. Maybe uh, they they wrote up some of the uh, uh, retirees in agronomy, and I say I go way back. Fred Patterson and Jim Ulrich were just kids when I got here. And I say that I uh, remember greeting. President Elliot on Hello Walk many times during my undergraduate, and that that was a tradition, you know. And he 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 did it on purpose. He lived over town, but he'd walk this Hello Walk and and, and greet students. And uh, Chief Wienko, we called him Chief rather than Head back in that day, was head of agronomy. I worked. He gave me this uh, job of twenty five cents an hour. He was head. I was under Doc Scarseth, and uh, John Skinner was Dean of Agriculture, Martin Luther Fisher, uh, he uh, was uh, 
dean of agriculture, Martin Luther Fisher was uh, dean of students, and uh, Skidder was dean of agriculture. And I had guys teach me like Allison Cutler LaForge and Daddy Aikenhead. And I say here that, uh, that I took surveying under George Spencer, who was head of ag engineering, and uh, the um, uh, celery bog, which is all developed now, all part of it's still there. One of our class projects was to survey that. And I say it took me so long that where we started at a benchmark over on an ag hall step, <laughs> it changed one half inch by the time I got through. And then I worked uh, with uh, Doc Hofer and Scarseth, and one of the treats was to go out in the cornfield to visit with them. And I did, uh, this was back before, Frank uh, did uh, sh uh, sugar beets with him, and Roscoe Fraser did tomatoes with him. And, uh, this is a big one, Back then, agronomy had two bowling teams in a 30-team league. Jack Wilbur and Chris Sirian did our records by hand. And Chris Sirian's daughter lives here. So it's a small world. And, uh, yeah, this tells me uh, Helmut Conkey was my major professor. Rome Finley over at Mitchell Farms gave us support money for this irrigation. And uh, Dr. Peterson uh, always said I was the first staff member that he had hired as uh, superintendent of the new agronomy farm. That was in 49. The old research farm was where Kohler's Nursery used to be over on 26. The city was crowding out that way, so they wanted to develop out toward Klondike, and um, uh, so I was the first superintendent when they first started that, and I credit Mr. Mulvey and Mr. Miles for helping me get started trying to make a general farm into a research farm. Okay, that took care of that. And what was the next step then? When you first well, when, you well, tell us about the farm and what was your that that was your your baby. What all? okay to take a a general farm. This was Lyman Farm. Lyman had a coal business in in Lafayette, but he had land out there, and Ryan Dykster lived on it, did the farming for him. But the university wanted to locate out in that nice area there for research purposes. So they had to make this transition of of getting him off the farm and buying the farm from Mr. Lyman. And the reaction wasn't too good for university to take over their land. Because, and I remember that, that I spent many Sunday afternoon bringing in farmers for, uh, from the area trying to make uh, friends out of them and feeding them strawberries and ice cream because I wanted them to realize that this wasn't a bad thing to have in their area. Here this new agronomy farm and animal science wasn't located there yet. So we were the first one that went over there on 52 and um, started to develop that as a research farm. And this gal over here and I Start married life in a little old house that had been moved twice to get 52 in there. They made it larger, and none of the doors would close. <laughs> they closed at an angle if they did, and that's where we got started raising these three boys, and we had a, a bedroom from them for them no bigger than a walk-in closet that you probably have today, and we stacked one on top of the other. But from uh, 49 to, uh, to 57, we lived in this little house and tried to raise these three boys. Well, you asked, uh, what Was the house on the property? House was on the property, okay. and that went, went with the job. 
three hundred dollars a month plus the house. Okay. Well, let me ask you: Where did you meet your wife? Did you meet her here? Tell us a little bit about where. Uh, where did, did I used to what? Where did you meet your wife here? No, oh. no. She is a um, army nurse, and I was in the navy, and we both came back to Edwardsport. And she was Freelandville. I talked to about these little county. Uh, school. She was a rival of Edwardsport because she went to Freelandville and I went to Edwardsport. We both got back in this little town out of the military and uh, all our friends had been married so we kind of, we knew each other back uh, way back when and uh, used to her dad would give uh, me a ride from Edwardsport back home after her ball practice. So. So we had a relationship, but uh, anyway, uh, she came back and became a nurse at Evansville, and I came up here and uh, continued my graduate work. Okay. And so then we uh, grew closer together and finally got married in uh, da, 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 48. Okay. And this little kid came along in 49. Okay. This one came in 51, that one came in 54. Okay. Okay. Now we're at the farm. You moved out. Farm between Klondike and Montmorency on Highway 52. And um, as I said, it's a big job to take a general farm and make a research farm out of it. You first, you had to lay out fields. You had to establish permanent markers and research work you always have to have a place to to go back to and measure your field so you know exactly where you are in that field. So every 500 feet, we would put a permanent marker, and Mr. Miles was big with that. It was a wet farm. We had a lot of, uh, it was fairly level, uh, and I'll touch a little bit on something else, but uh, to drain it. For research work, you want to try to do everything uniform except what the researcher's studying. So if, if poor drainage is a factor, they, whatever they're studying isn't too good. If they're breeding corn and they have their, their corn nursery drowned out because of too much water, that's not good. So you try to have the land uniform as possible as far as drainage, uh, fertilization, and other things. And it was a fairly good site, but uh, drainage was a big problem. But uh, it is also, and uh, this is written up by uh, Jim Beatty, who has now got my, have my job, and uh, part of this land is on prairie land, and part of it is on timber land. Land developed from trees was uh, developed under tree culture. And we have next to 52, that's where that land was developed. Now, if you go back north, uh, you get on the prairie-type soils. And we don't have too many prairie-type soils in Indiana. We have a little finger coming out into Indiana from Illinois, and Iowa has a lot of prairie, but it's developed under grassland culture and more has more organic matter and is... It's leveler and uh, more productive, providing you, you drain it. But to take that land and develop it so people can do their research on it uh, was a big, big challenge. And uh, uh, back in 49, we just had a general farm building there. Mr. Lyman liked horses, had a great big orange barn out there. And uh, it was a big decision, do we tear down this old orange barn, which didn't fit research work at all. And we kept it for a number of years and finally tore it down. But uh, it was a landmark there as far as being a, a big barn out, out in the country. And um, uh, when we first got started, I guess we had about 40 or 50 researchers that did land. We call it the agronomy farm back at that time. They call it a research center now. But agronomy had the administration of the land. But if botany and plant pathology, 
uh, etymology, or even even someone even remote out of agriculture like pharmacy, if they had need for land for their research, it became my responsibility to try to take care of them as far as land and their needs for doing <laughs> research in, in, the, in the field. Okay. And I did that for 37 years. And uh, did, the, did the size of the property expand? It, it, when I left, it was nearly 700 <laughs> acres, and now it's nearly 1,000 acres. So... Uh, they bought up surrounding land? Yeah. And uh, that was uh, big to try to help develop that, but not as big as taking it the initial step. Right. Buildings and uh, facilities. We never did get good water supply. We wanted a good water supply out there for irrigation and for other needs. And um, the, the water resource isn't too good now. You go to animal science, I'm not sure if you know too much about the layout of the farms out there, but after we established there, um, uh, the hog farm was moved out there from here and from uh, north of town. Then the, uh, the cattle farm, the chicken farm, and the dairy all are part of this unit now. So uh, university probably has about four or five thousand acres in the Klondike, Montmorency area, and it's all joined together. And that was kind of their aim at the time when they first started out there with us moving from coal and nursery out there. Okay. And uh, if I haven't said before, uh, I was very lucky to get that job. I guess I didn't say that I did this research and, and worked with people in labs. And I said, oh, I like research, but I don't want to be stuck in a lab all day long. But then this job just came along when I had completed my master's after the war, and the search committee kind of knew me because I had worked as a, uh, as a undergraduate and as a graduate, and so I don't know that they thought I had the, the uh, talent to do it, but uh, they liked me, and so I was lucky to get this job. Okay, but tell us about the house. When did you get another house? You said you lived in, in there. In 57. They finally decided Oz needs more space to raise these three boys. He's he's really and <laughs> it was a horrible house. Actually, in a little room, the three of them. Three of them, <laughs> and the, and we didn't have water there either. And so often, uh, uh, Louise, my wife, would do her washing and hang it on the line because we didn't have a dryer. And uh, then the wind would blow down, and uh, we'd have to move water from this location back to our little house in order for her to wash again in milk cans. Wow. So it, it wasn't an easy life, but as I look back, it was a most rewarding life. Right. Where was school for the children? Was it close? Where'd they go to school? They went to Klondike, oh. and then uh, Harrison started, and he was a second class in Harrison. And he was about the last class in Klondike. Okay, okay, all right. So uh, that, that to have a school. But did you did, they, did you continue to have a house on the property, or did you live elsewhere? Yeah, in, uh, in they built it back uh, from the road a little bit, and uh, uh, in '57, and that they they had their well, we had two bedrooms for three bedroom house, so we, we had that. <laughs> Two and one, one and another. Sure. But, uh, uh, Let me ask you something. Were you were here when the king and queen of Afghanistan came? Did they come out to that farm? Yeah. Tell us yeah. about that. Were well, you there? Uh, I remember that uh, we had a lot of visitors out there. But uh, here, this was escorted by police. And <laughs> the king and queen? Uh, huh? the, the king and queen of Afghanistan. The king came out there, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he came out. And Did you see him? Oh, yeah, but uh, we, we drove him around the farm. I don't know if he was impressed or not, but I was impressed because uh, during the year we would have probably uh, as many as uh, uh, 60, 70 groups come out to 
to visit the farm. What what type of groups would they be? Well, they would be from, uh, I expect uh, 20 or 30 of them would be international groups. Okay. They wanted to see what was what was going on? Research. They were anxious to pick up uh, the research. And uh, others were from uh, different uh, uh, groups from Indiana, from various states. So uh, it was interesting from that standpoint. And, uh, and you got a chance to meet these people? Meet these people and try to tell them what agronomy was about as best I could. And show them around? Show them around, put them on a wagon. And uh, that was our standard way of putting them on a wagon, and and uh, the horses and would draw would draw the, the horses what? would draw. No, no. Oh. We got horses. I inherited horses uh, when I first went out there, and they were still at the old uh, soils and crop farm. That was the one out at nurse uh, at uh, Kohler's Nursery. But one of my first jobs that I remember was to get rid of these horses. And I had these three nearly retired people that came with a job that kind of had a love for these horses because they worked with them. And to get rid of the, this team of horses uh, was... Uh, not easy. Not easy. But uh, How did you manage to find the... How did you handle it? Well, uh, finally found we ran out of hay, so we had to do something with these horses. <laughs> um. See, what was tell us how the campus changed over time. Uh, uh, the campus what? changed. You talked about the fifties and sixties, but the campus has changed a lot over time, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Of course, they built up more housing and uh, residence halls. Uh, residence halls and uh, the eating at each little uh, diners down in the village changed because they fed them in the hall and. Uh, there used to be the, more eating facilities in the uh, oh, Chauncey? Oh, yeah. There, there must have been uh, 10 uh, little restaurants where we could get a plate lunch for 75 cents. Uh, and uh, That's pretty good. Yeah, that that kind of changed, too. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you got the, um, you were one of the nominees for that Arthur G. Hansen Recognition Award. Yeah. Yes. I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Uh, these, uh, I don't know if this, these are, by, I say, by the kindness to me or some of the awards that they've given me. Oh, very and, nice. Uh, you can Is there one particular one you want to comment on? You can have that. Uh, Tell us, well then, let's talk about the most recent one, the Legends in Agronomy Award. How did you, how did you learn about that? And for our researchers, tell them what that award entailed. That last the one? Legend, the Legend. The Legend, yeah. yeah. That was a complete surprise to me. Here, this old guy uh, retired at Westminster. Uh, they p didn't forget about him. But they were trying to find people who had somehow contributed to agronomy over the hundred years. And uh, they had people nominate them, and somehow I got, I was on the committee to be nominated. And lo and behold, I, my name was never mentioned, and then uh, Craig Baruti called me up and said, Oh, I don't want to surprise you, but you're, you're, you're in. <laughs> you're so, one of the winners. So, yeah, so that was a complete surprise. And the family came for the event? You know, came for the event. Oh, well, that's pretty nice. Uh, you must have been pretty much involved with the Purdue Agronomy Club too, weren't you? Great, you yeah, got an award yeah, there. Yeah, I got an award there, and that's hanging up here on the wall somewhere. Okay. I thought I had the hub the thing here, but maybe I don't. And then the year before, I got recognized as a uh, the old six. The Agronomy Achievement Award. Achievement, you know Where? about those. How did uh, how did you hear about that? Did they just give you a call? As a complete surprise too. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Yes. And again, uh, same thing. How did they pick up me for something like that? That's pretty nice. Yeah. And back uh, at the Silver Award and the Silver Anniversary of Agronomy Farm Field Day, they recognized me having been there 25 years, and then 06, uh, 86. 
uh, that's Louise and me uh, as we are retiring and uh, they uh, wrote me up uh, in 37 years. Wonderful. Yeah. What, then when, what year did you retire? In uh, 86, okay. and Louise died in 88, and so we got a t couple years of retirement. And we lived uh, north of uh, West Lafayette here. Uh, you had to move off the, you have to get up the house on the property? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I, uh, I moved uh, and had two and a half acres, and I wish I had that yet. I love to grow pretty things, love to grow uh, I was a corn soybean man probably at the farm, but I love to grow pretty, pretty uh, flowers and vegetables. I think it's just a miracle to stick a little bulb or seed in the ground and have something pretty come up. And we know a lot about how things grow, but we really don't know how does that become a plant. I mean, we know about photosynthesis and all that, but sure, uh, understand. But uh, as to really understand and it's a miracle that that a pretty flower I love to grow I had a, quite a bunch of iris and I moved some of them here and then gladiolas I love pretty gladiolas and have quite a collection of those so. yeah what uh, have what have you been doing in retirement what am I doing mm -hmm. not enough oh okay getting so blame lazy well let me tell you why I came here after Louise died, we wanted to buy a, or build a house of her own. That was uh, 86, we retired, but her health, she already had lymphoma, and uh, it was in uh, remission, but she wasn't able to plan a home, so we found this one out in the country. She liked the house, and it had two and a half acres of land with it, and I like that because I, I do, I wanted to put her around with the soil. So that worked out and we moved out there and then she died two years later. And uh, I didn't give two hoots of staying there, but somehow it kind of grew on me in the neighborhood and growing pretty things I liked. So I stayed there until uh, 05. And then I got the same thing that she had, lymphoma. And I took chemo and uh, pretty, pretty uh, tough stuff. Uh, and the doctor said, you've got a type of cancer that uh, is most curable. And it had changed quite a bit from when she had it. And I, I think there's different types of lymphoma too. And different individuals react differently. But uh, said, you've got the most curable, well, but it's the most harsh treatment. So I had, and I knew that summer of, um, of 05 that I thought it was just the humidity and the heat, but I didn't have the energy. And finally, one day I said, I'm coming in to here to put in my reservation, went over to the doctor at the same time, and they diagnosed it after a bunch of tests as lymphoma, and then I had uh, eight severe chemo treatments, and somehow, they made me well. Very nice. And right. now, now I'm here. Right. Okay. And uh, I, I I grumble a lot about not having my land to to raise pretty things because they just give you uh, a little little section for a garden here. But I guess it was for a purpose. And, and as I look at it now, this is a good place for me. Maybe I was ready for it and didn't really know it. I'd probably, if I hadn't had it, I'd probably try to be out there yet. And uh, I'm 87 years old and going on 88, so probably you need to get out of the boondock and come in here with the rest of the old folks. Uh, can you tell us, do you have a favorite memory of Purdue or a tradition that sticks in your mind that uh, you'd like to share with us? Favorite? Golly, you hit me at the wrong time on that. I don't know. Is there a tradition, like the Boilermaker Special, any tradition that sticks well, in Well, I was in the Reamer Club, so okay. athletics was very close to me. Did you go to the game? Did you go to the sports, athletics, basketball, and yeah, football? Yeah, basketball. I've uh, not missed a, if I were in town, other than 
being away from the war, I haven't missed a uh, football game or many basketball games since I came in in uh, thirty eight. Can you still go to them? I Can still go to them, get a good. ticket. And, That's very good. And you see that as you were greeted by John Purdue here, I I, I feel that, that that Matt there says you were greeted. The team away from the team, whatever it said over there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, other than being extremely interested with agriculture yet, some people I think, and I criticize them, kind of give up when they come here. I've had it. But I want to go back to the farm, and Jim Beatty is very nice to me to let me come back there anytime. Sure. The people I sold my house to let me dig up these irises and come back here anytime. So I'm fortunate on that, but I love growing things. And uh, so agriculture is still very dear to my heart. And I love to go to ag meetings, uh, uh, farm management tours and agronomy meetings and stuff to try to keep abreast somehow of right. what technology has changed. And it has just changed tremendously. Right. I, I, I just can't imagine what they can do with, with a little kernel of corn now. Right. Yeah. Do you have a, um, how about an outstanding event in your life? Would you like, do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share with us that comes to mind? Outstanding event. Well, these honors were always, uh, and you've got uh, quite a few, surprised me uh, very much. And of course, uh, I was extremely lucky to marry this gal here, so wedding and, and family. Uh, some people talk about family, right. but we are very close as a family. Back when Louise and I first were married, we go to McCormick's Creek at uh, Spencer, Indiana. Kind of that was our, our vacation. And uh, then we started taking these three boys there, and, and they, it got in their blood. And they they would do their uh, ranger schedule and their work. We got to go for a week at McCormick's Creek in the summertime. Now these grandkids are doing the same thing. We want to be back there, so we have a big reunion every summer of everybody, and, and until. Last year, maybe two of them didn't get to it. Everybody's been there. And then we try to get together at Christmas some way. So uh, uh, that's, that, yeah, that's very important in my life. And uh, that's very I, nice. I, I don't say that really uh, just because everybody brags on their family, but I think we're real unique. I really do. To be as closely. These three boys just just are, are a pleasure to be with the way they heckle each other <laughs> about going back to that little house where we used to live. How, how this one accused of, of uh, getting rebel lost, a little dog lost, and uh, and that type of stuff. And that goes on the whole time. So so the good reminisce, good memories. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. In yeah, in closing, do you have any specific any comments you'd like to say in closing for the researchers? Can you summarize any general comments at the end? Yeah. Where did I say this? I should have had this a little more organized, but. Uh, uh, oh, you're in fine shape. Ah, uh, I told Greg Baruti to never let the new staff members forget the heritage that they had in this legend because the agronomy department was very close to. Dr. Peterson not only was head of the department, but his wife and he gathered us together and made us an agronomy family. So it was very important that you uh, knew the rest of the people in the department, knew their children and that type of thing. And uh, I think uh, there's a lot of good things in this world, but <clears throat> growing plants is pretty, pretty essential. And Earl Butts will tell you that, that you could have the arts and that type of thing, but when it gets down to 
uh, having to uh, have the essential food, clothing, and housing are the things. And I always felt like being at the Gromney farm, I helped contribute to the world food supply in a by trying to keep these scientists happy. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. This concludes it. Thank you very much.